Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Digital Health and Wearables series. I have another magnificent guest for you today, but before I go ahead, let me acknowledge our series sponsor, HP, Elliot Bacard Enterprise, and also our global partner, Spirit Digital. And you have, if you have not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Amazing content from the previous guests, and also share this great content with your communities in healthcare. But we go straight to the guest today. I have a, a fantastic guest for you. Great pleasure to introduce Sunil James. He's a Senior Director of Security Engineering, AHP. Sunil, how are you? Joao, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. It's very hot in England, as I was telling you, which is very unusual. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, I'm actually uh, uh, video calling you from New York right now, and it's uh, almost uh, uh, 95 Fahrenheit today, so it's going to be quite quite hot here as well. So Fantastic. Lovely to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time and being here on the channel with us. Of course, happy to do so. So we go straight to the questions, and the first question that I have for you, Sunil, is why do you think we have so many data breaches and leakages in the healthcare industry? Well, I think, I, I don't think it's specific to the healthcare industry. I think that whether it's healthcare or retail or financial services or anything in between, I think that the challenges that we have is that you know the supply chain of technology that's being provided to all of these industries is getting smaller and smaller. Yes, in healthcare, you do have specialized devices that are designed for very specific purposes like other industries. But if we're talking about general purpose, server, client infrastructure, mobile infrastructure, networking devices, things of that sort, that supply chain of vendors is relatively small. And I think that the, the reason why I think you're seeing more threats and more um, breaches happening that has is a combination of things. I think first you're finding that most enterprises are developing or evolving their architectures to take advantage of much more dynamic computing, storage, networking technologies. Whether it's public cloud, whether it's technologies like GreenLake, whether it's anything in between, it's changing how enterprises are thinking about building their infrastructure. And when you change, right, to take advantage of much more flexible constructs, Security needs to evolve with that. And I don't know if most organizations really understand how to evolve their existing security architectures to accommodate this new world because they haven't really understood yet the threat landscape of that new architecture. So I think that creates a gap that could potentially create opportunities for more breaches to occur. I think the other thing that happens more often than not, and I don't know what to do about this is there is this desire for all businesses to deliver value faster. So every business, every company is trying to figure out how do I build new solutions to problems, get it into the hands of customers and the hopes of trying to reach your customers sooner and faster. And I think when you do that, I think one of the easy things to, uh, to ignore or maybe not to invest in as much as is security, secure software development practices, um, penetration testing, runtime security protection capabilities, whatever it might be. And so I think there's a combination of things that are causing more breaches, not just in healthcare, but in other areas as well. Sure. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastic points there. I mean, the, what you just mentioned about uh, organizations want to deliver fast without kind of understanding fully the problems is also an issue. Uh, thanks for mentioning that. Going straight to the second question. In terms of uh, cybersecurity and security in general, how does healthcare differ and or compare with other industries? In terms of its uh, the, the requirements or its readiness, what specific are you curious about? Maybe the infrastructure and the, and the security as a over, overall. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, as I said beforehand, I think that there are always nuances between industries in terms of uh, 
the kind of computing capabilities that they have for you know their business as i mentioned before you might have medical devices in hospitals as one example of of of, of something that is bespoke in the healthcare industry right but the healthcare industry is large and a lot of it is not nothing to do with devices it's to do with server infrastructure and storage infrastructure either running in data centers or in cloud or things of that sort so i think from the standpoint of uh, kind of the core uh, enterprise computing requirements, I don't necessarily see it being that different than than others. Um, I do see more of an opportunity for enterprises and for healthcare uh, companies uh, to potentially start looking at delivering value to their users and to their patients and to their stakeholders much more faster. So I think you're going to see much more of an evolution for these edge oriented architectures right the whole point of edge is to figure out ways in which real-time computational capabilities can exist close to where data is being generated so that decisions can be made faster whatever that decision might be made whether it's in the context of a hospital a research laboratory or anything in between so i think you're seeing some changes in terms of the evolution there if you agree you know assuming you agree with that or your viewers agree with that statement I think that the the cyber uh, specific capabilities that we're talking about for that vertical, for the your vertical in particular, the, the healthcare vertical, I think are going to be very very uh, uh, similar in nature. In fact, I think that's a good thing in some strange way because there's lots of learnings from other industries that I think are going to be applicable to uh, to your business as a whole. Um, Outside of that, if we wanted to look at just straight uh, uh, kind of uh, some of the IoT and bespoke computing devices, I think that there are quite a bit of differences. I think the requirements in terms of making sure that devices that are connected to the internet, that are responsible for providing all types of life-saving capabilities or monitoring services or things of that sort, I think the bar is naturally higher because they impact actual human life, uh, perhaps more so than IoT devices like a thermostat or something like that, perhaps. And I think as a result of that, I think there is a higher bar to ensure that those devices have gone through a greater degree of scrutiny mm -hmm. in terms of their certification processes, their continuous verification as they are updated in terms of the software that's running on them. And I think you're going to also find enterprises and healthcare companies being much more cautious in terms of updating. Uh, I remember you know, to bring an analogy, I remember in the in the early 90s, mid 90s as well, many enterprise financial services networks who were terrified uh, of updating all of their Windows infrastructure because Microsoft had patches because they had no idea what the ramifications were going to be if there was some sort of a problem in the patch itself. And I could see that being even more so the case for medical devices, especially if they've not gotten the same level of scrutiny as they feel they need to. Well, fantastic point. Sunil, you mentioned the, I mean, the medical devices, and uh, let me give you a very. Uh, I just always remember this example. I was at a cybersecurity conference in London ba back in the days when you had events, right? <laughs> and the, this the cybersecurity expert shared this data uh, leakage. It, it was an intrusion from a from a fish tank. Unbelievable! From a device that was in a fish tank, they accessed the data. But anyway, it was it was incredible. Amazing. Was like, everybody, it's amazing. Yeah, it's just, in the end, it's it, the fish tank is it has some sort of computational capabilities. It has some kind of network connectivity, and it has software. Yeah. And so it's it's a computer, <laughs> yeah. for all intents and purposes. It's just packaged as a fish tank. So unbelievable. But you mentioned great things that, of course, the edge to cloud computing that you leading the way. I think that leads very nicely to the third and last question that I have for you. And can you share some good practices, any case studies, or any relevant projects on cybersecurity in healthcare, please? In healthcare itself, uh, well, again, I, I think that there, I mean, you know, I, from the standpoint of HP as a company, we obviously have quite a bit of, of, of uh, expertise and uh, knowledge in terms of helping healthcare companies 
uh, not only develop and evolve their existing IT computing infrastructures, but also thinking about how they can evolve their security architectures, going back to the first question that we had beforehand. So I would, I think that, I mean, obviously I work for HPE, but I do think that there's quite a bit of expertise and intelligence in our uh, point next capabilities and our consulting capabilities, both us and through our partnership that I think can help our customers actually start thinking about evolving their, their security architectures. I think that there are a number of great resources out there that I think people should be studying as well. I think, for example, these zero trust concepts that you might be hearing about in the news uh, that have been around for a few years now, uh, I think zero trust infrastructure or a zero trust ready infrastructure, I think is a really great um, mindset to think about how to prepare your enterprise network for a much more dynamic enterprise computing environment. Mm -hmm. The concept of enabling and only allowing for uh, systems that have been verified at the time that they need to transact on a network and then to be continuously verified as a model is exactly the model you want to be moving towards itself because of the fact that things are not static. I think the other thing that I'm also uh, conscious of and, and thinking more about is industry consortiums that are uh, trying to understand how we can better share information between our partners. So, for example, I do know that much like in the financial services world, there are information sharing analysis centers or ISACs that exist. I believe there's a healthcare ISAC as well that facilitates information sharing about threats and vulnerabilities and exploitation attempts so that you, your partners, and others can be sharing information to mutually have protections for shared customers and shared um, patients as well. So these are some high-level ideas. Obviously, we can spend some time and I can work with you and send you some details specific to that, but that's where I might start. Really, thank, thank you so much for that. It, it's extremely important, as you know, in, in healthcare, the collaboration piece, but also the relevance around the security. But, Many companies now are, are really acknowledging that the way forward is through collaboration. So what you shared is actually really powerful that you have these practices and these expertise in, in, in place. Yeah, if I could say one more thing, I, I think that um, I think many organizations think that security can be solved through just a set of products and technologies. Uh, I don't believe that at all. Uh, security is the kind of thing having been a practitioner for, for the last 22 years now that um, as an enterprise security company and as a security practitioner, you're always having to keep up to date because the attacker only has to be correct once. Right. You have to be correct all the time. And so it's important to recognize and have a sense of humility that it's not just about a technology. It's about a practice. It's about a discipline. It's about collaboration. It's about recognizing that you're not always going to be on top of things. If you assume that you're behind, it will keep you in the correct mindset to keep looking and protecting because that's the goal and responsibility. So, Sunil, fantastic. That, that's, that's really good. That reminds me to make to establish a comparison with the, with the fitness stuff. If you want to keep fit, you have to keep training, isn't it? And that's exactly right. I could make exactly. an analogy there. You yeah, can't, that's exactly right. What you've done last year is not going to keep you fit uh, for this year. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, what are you doing really last year? Well yes, exactly. Sunil, we come to the end of the episode. No more questions, but I finish all my episodes in a peculiar way. It's not really a question as such. It's called One Minute of Fame. You can share anything that is relevant, I mean, uh, pr professionally or... Uh, uh, personal achievement, you can share about HP, you can share about your family, anything whatsoever. So to round up, one minute of fame, over to you. One minute, one minute of fame? One minute of fame, fame. Fame, okay, fame. Uh, well, I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the time as well, Joao. It's really nice to, to connect with you again. Uh, and I appreciate your interest in the work that we're doing. Uh, it was a lot of hard work, but uh, we've got a lot more to go as well. And you'll be hearing more about that over the coming quarters and years. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I have been um, in the world of technology for my entire adult life. I've been uh, both in the offensive security side of things, uh, as well as the defensive security side of things. I have been involved in uh, in all kinds of aspects of our domain, I've grown up in this industry. 
It's an industry that um, those of us that have been in it for a long time, there's a um, there's a, a camaraderie that I think we're pretty excited about. So I'm really excited about being part of that community. And I think there are many people who want to become part of that community and they might feel like it's daunting. It's not. There are communities of people out there that are ready to invite you in, coach you, help you get connected with other people. So I would encourage other people to do more of that. I'm doing more of that as well myself. And so if people are interested in thinking about a career in cybersecurity in whatever form or fashion, I'm always happy to grab time with any of your viewers or anybody else that they might know and you know just kind of walk them through my story and my experience and uh, see if that might be helpful to them on their own journey as well so i'll leave it at that Sunil, thank you so much fantastic way to to finish um i'm gonna i'm gonna round up now let me personally uh, thank you again for your time sharing all your expertise and everything and for that open approach which uh, i really like that thanks joe i really appreciate it and i appreciated the time today thank you for that Brilliant. I'm going to round up now. So thank you so much for our viewers. Make sure you subscribe with this magnificent content. I'm going to post also a link about HP, but also uh, um, Sunil's LinkedIn profile. Ask him questions. As you mentioned, he's open for you to interact. And I'll see you all next time.